Hello and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Brenda Platt, the Director of the Composting for Community Initiative at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. I'm based in the Washington, D.C. area, but we're a national nonprofit. And this is part one of a three-part webinar series. We may extend it, but the series is on government support for community composting. And this is part one, Spotlight on New York City. Um, our webcams are not working today, so uh, uh, but we do have photos of our staff and the presenters since you can't see us. But that's me, Brenda Platt, and uh, I want to introduce my uh, colleagues, Clarissa Libertelli, who's the coordinator of the Community Composter Coalition, and Sophia Jones, who's a policy fellow with our composting team today. So. Um, we're uh, hosting this uh, webinar today. I want to just do a shout out to our sponsors. The 11th Hour Project is one of our main sponsors of the um, Composting for Community Initiative here at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and particularly of our for forums and networking events supporting community composting. We do have other funders, uh, but 11th Hour is our main one. And then a special shout out to Biobag, who has uh, been providing scholarships for those who couldn't afford to um, pay the registration fee. So thanks to Biobag for that. And um, today, uh, let me just say, tee up the other two webinars, which will be uh, in June. Part two will focus on food scrap collectors and composters with municipal contracts. So we have a number of those uh, companies who are working with municipalities, sometimes counties. So that'll be June 8th, same time. And then part three will focus on cities and counties with public-private partnerships with community composters. So we just go to our website. We'll put the links for both those events in the chat so you'll have them and you can see who the speakers are. That one will be June 23rd. If you do register for those, um, even if you can't attend, you will be sent the recording as you will be for today's. Um, so today we're here with Spotlight on New York City. I'm so happy about today's event um, as I've been following the New York City Community Compost uh, project for so many years, and New York City's been such a leader in this space. I'm going to introduce our three speakers um, in a few minutes, but today we have um, Debbie with the Department of Sanitation, Renee with the Lower East Side Ecology Center, and Devon with the uh, New York City Compost Project hosted by Big Reuse, and we'll talk a little bit more about um, what they'll be speaking on. First, I just want to let folks know that here at the Institute, we've been convening uh, a coalition, as I mentioned, and cultivating community composting and supporting this new kind of, it's not so new anymore, actually, but sector of, of composting. We have in the past yeah. been doing in-person forums. Um, we've been uh, hosting workshops, webinars like this. We have a podcast, Composting for Community podcast. You can check that out. If you're a member of the coalition, um, we have a Google group. We have guides, we do policy, we do training, we have videos, so check check that out. Um, this is a gives you an idea of some of our past webinars. Most of these are available for free on our website at that link, so ilsr.org slash um, community hyphen composting hyphen webinars. Maybe we can put the link for that as well in the chat. Uh, the last few we did, Last year was one on equipment for small scale sites and then using and selling compost from com community sites. Those are the two most recent ones. And during COVID, we've moved our Neighborhood Soil Rebuilders training program to an online certificate course. And uh, you can take this at your own pace and get a certificate at the end. And um, so check that out. But today, what we're going to focus on is small scale decentralized. And in fact, that's the series. So, you know, this is the hierarchy we put together with a lens of scale, really, size and local, if you will. So, of course, we want to reduce waste. We want to rescue food that can be eaten, promote home composting. Um, but this is kind of most preferred to least preferred before we do, obviously, landfilling or incineration or mixed waste treatment or centralized. Um, can how how can we be promoting small scale decentralized? And the answer is yes, but often this is um, not fully uh, supported or invested or prioritized. So 
New York City has been doing a wonderful job on this over many years. We'll be hearing about this. And let me just say that small scale decentralized, say, what is community composting? Maybe we should have defined this at the beginning, is kind of the not so radical idea that you're producing and using compost within the same community in which that organic material, discarded organic material is being generated. So you're keeping it local. Um, I just wanted to share since we released this other infographic we produced just yesterday, shout out to my colleague Clarissa who did the amazing art for this, but we just released this since it is International Compost Awareness Week, um, this week, May 1st to May 8th, uh, 7th. So um, how composting combats, combats the climate crisis. So check that out, feel free to share it. It's available at ilsr.org slash compost hyphen climate. We'll put a link in the chat for that as well. And before we get started, we just want to run a few polls now. So the first one, just to get an idea who is participating today, I know we asked you for this information when you registered, um, but just so we all can get an idea of who's on the webinar today. So Clarissa, we are ready for the poll. So select one or more of the following. I would say pick the one that most speaks to who you, who you are. So are you a community composter? Maybe you're that and you're also a food scrap collection service provider. If you're government, what level? And if you don't fit into any of those categories, obviously you're other. So we have 82% of you voting already. Local government, almost half of you, yes. State or federal government, everybody is welcome today. Thanks for participating. All right, the next poll is for community composters. So only if you were among one, and, and if you selected food scrap hauler, you can answer this too. But if you're a food scrap hauler, a community composter, how can government best support you? And you can select all that apply, but if there's something that really speaks to you that's really important, pick that. All right, we only have 30% of you voting, but that's about only 30% of attendees fit into this category, so let's show the results. All right, funding, hmm, surprise. Long-term access to land, almost one-third. Zoning and permitting, important. Nobody selected other, probably because we didn't list other policies, okay. And then the um, last poll we'll do right now is for those of you who are with uh, government. And I put local government on this slide, but really if you're government, even state and federal, please participate, so ignore that other slide. If you're with a government agency, what ways can you support community composting? If you're already supporting community composting, of course you'll answer, but if you're, you know, a small hamlet somewhere and maybe you can't do all of this direct funding, but you have access to land and you think that's within your toolbox, then check that. So we wanna see about 50% of you voting since that's how many of you indicated you are with a government agency and we're very close to that. All right, let's share the results. All right, communications, marketing, education help, half of you. Startup funding, not so much direct funding. Okay, one fifth, that's good. Access to land not as high as it could be and other. So um, what I wanna share with you, we did this year a census of community composters and we have the data in, we're still an analyzing it. So we'll be doing a webinar later this year on the results of the census. Uh, but what I wanted to share with you today is we asked this question on the census, what kind of public and or private sector assistance would be mo most useful to your operation? I'm not gonna read all of these, but just, um, some of the, the top ones here, long-term access to land, more than 40% of respondents, grants, grant writing assistance, pretty high, um, supplies and equipment, helping with that, that's another funding, obviously, um, thing that can help, and policies to encourage composting and 
or food waste recovery was very high. So the institutional context and policies is, is important. All right, so just a flavor of that. Thanks for participating. And uh, now let me introduce our, um, our presenters today. So we're going to start with Debbie Scheintalk. She's the Director of Compost Programs and Partnerships with the New York City Department of Sanitation, and she oversees outreach not only for the residential curbside composting program, but also the food scrap drop-off program, community composting, and um, compost education, and she's also overseeing the compost distribution program, which again is local, in uh, in the city. Then uh, Renee Crawley is the deputy director of the Lower East Side Ecology Center. We'll be speaking next. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Ecology Center, it's been a pioneer in com community-based models of urban sustainability since 1987. And for more than a decade, the Ecology Center has partnered with the New York City Department of Sanitation um, to carry out the help carry out New York City compost project programs. And then we'll wrap up the presentation with Devin Reitzma, project coordinator with the New York Compost Project hosted by Big Reuse, who again is part of the community scale composting network in the city. And Devin will talk about this more, but of course I'll just share that you know Big Reuse is working with more than 70 food scrap drop-off sites and to collect it, but also to process it locally at two sites in the city. He'll talk about that. And I'll just say now that there are many, many community composting sites throughout the city. So you're just going to get a flavor of these two today. Um, I will stop sharing my screen um, now, Clarissa, and if you could bring up the um, uh, the um, Debbie's presentation. Uh, I think Sophia has got the slides now, so she's going to make herself presenter, I think. Awesome. Okay. Brenda, you might have to make me presenter. Change presenter. Okay. Give me a second here. Stop showing. Change presenter. I think I might have just done it. Sophia, are you presenter? That's good. That's mm -hmm. good. All right, so we're going to start. As you bring that up, let me just say, Debbie, I'm going to hand the mic to you in a second. But Debbie's going to go through kind of an introduction and context, an overview of composting in New York City, all of the Department of Sanitation's programs, and then a deeper dive on the New York City Compost Project, public education, engagement, technical assistance to the community compost sites, and more. And then uh, Renee with the Lower East Side is going to talk about community composting there and beyond. And then Devin will wrap up with what is possible with municipal support. All right, so handing the mic to you, Debbie, welcome. Great, thank you so much, Brenda. Um, happy, good afternoon, everyone. Happy International Compost Awareness Week. We're really excited. Um, my name is Debbie Scheintock, um, Director of Compost Programs and Partnerships for the New York City Department of Sanitation. I'm going to start with a little bit of a bird's eye view of all the um, organics programs that sanitation runs. So um, Renee, uh, Devin and I merged our presentations into this one. So first I'm going to talk about the Department of Sanitation um, broadly, the Bureau of Recycling and Sustainability that runs the organic programs. And then we'll narrow in on the variety of organics programs that are being run through the department. Um, I'll then highlight um, our primary community composting program, which is the NYC Compost Project, um, and all the different activities that are run through the Compost Project um, to advance community composting in New York City. Um, and then Renee and Devin are going to do their presentations, kind of narrow in on two kind of specific partnerships that we've um, that we've developed and maintained over 29 years. Okay, so the New York City Department of Sanitation, the next slide. Um, who are we? Um, we basically keep, you know, we clear the garbage, we handle the recycling, uh, we plow the snow, and we handle litter. Uh, we're the largest municipal sanitation department in the United States. 
Uh, we service over 8.5 million New Yorkers. So um, that, that might give you a little clue as to why we have um, a variety of strategies to handle organics in New York City. There's not a one size fits all. It's a big city. There's lots of different um, housing stock, um, languages, um, borough profiles that we need to kind of uh, meet the needs of lots of different audiences. Um, we collect 10,500 tons of refuse, 2,000 tons of recyclables a day, over 9,000 employees, over 2,000 collection trucks, four marine transfer stations, uh, one, one rail state transfer station, and three compost facilities. Okay, next slide. Um, we are one bureau of the New York City Department of Sanitation. So I'm housed in the Bureau of Recycling and Sustainability. And basically um, my bureau deals with uh, sustainable management of all the constituent components of the waste stream. So obviously uh, recyclables, your traditional metal, glass, plastic, paper uh, recyclables. Um, then there's the organics recycling. So food scraps and yard waste. Uh, we handle e-waste. There's a whole team that handles e-waste. There's another team that handles clothing and textiles, whether that's reuse or recycling. Um, there's harmful products management, safe disposal. Um, we have a whole team that works on building on the reuse sector that's donate um, donations and reuse. We have a team that does specific outreach to schools, uh, a team that does specific outreach to businesses to encourage zero waste behavior. Uh, I do want to qualify that with saying we don't uh, manage nor do we haul from the private sector. That's kind of the cost of doing business in New York City. The Department of Sanitation focuses on the residential sector as well as like agencies and institutions. So if you're a school, firehouse, library, we will service, we will service you. Um, but if you're a business, you need to hire a private car. Uh, we provide decals and information on all these programs and other random how to get rid of um, initiatives. So take back, take back programs, uh, plastic bags, things of that nature. Okay, next slide. Um, so our bureau um, has six, you know, I would say five, six uh, different types of composting programs, curbside composting, drop off composting, community composting, home and backyard composting, uh, compost distribution programs, and seasonal composting. And we support all these initiatives. Um, you know, we basically, big city, 8.5 million New Yorkers, we need all these strategies to increase buy-in and produce long-term behavior change uh, to divert <laughs> organics from landfill disposal. Why? Why do we care? As probably everyone on this uh, on this call knows, over one third of the residential waste in New York City is suitable for composting. Um, so, so we basically, you know, um, so where is it? Yes, thirty four percent. So we we do. This was uh, found out in the twenty seventeen waste characterization study. Uh, so we basically have a lot of material to handle and make sure it's managed properly. Okay, the next slide. Um, as many of us on this call know, uh, food scraps and yard waste um, produce methane, which is up to 30 times more toxic uh, than carbon dioxide. So greenhouse gas emissions is one of the primary drivers for us seeking to divert uh, organics from landfill disposal creating a more sustainable New York City. We also um, are looking to advance better quality of life. We have serious rats in New York and it's it's pretty simple, you know, if you can containerize or, you know, your organics. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to New York City, but there's, no matter how fancy a building you live in, uh, refuse is still set out at the curb and organics is in the refuse and it's in big black bags and we have a serious rat issue and, uh, so we build a lot of partnerships with the Department of Health uh, and Mental Hygiene to make a clear case that if you put the material in a containerized bin, we will have less rodents. Um, 
And then obviously beneficial reuse, uh, the, the compost distribution program. Um, we, for a long time before we ran any uh, curbside collection of food scraps, we were collecting um, leaves and uh, plant trimmings and woody debris, um, turning that into mulch and compost. And now we're adding the food scraps um, and we're able to uh, distribute that material um, and create a, you know, our, our whole campaign slogan is make, make compost not trash, basically. So we can create a commodity instead of creating, uh, you know, waste. Okay, curbside composting, basically just like um, our, you know, just like our recycling program or just like our refuse program, we collected the curb, um, food scraps, food soil paper and yard waste um, from residents in certain nonprofits and city agencies across the city. Um, residents receive a uh, brown bin uh, with a latching lid and they can also receive a kitchen container uh, for in the home. And we collect on a set schedule every week. So once a week we collect and we use our existing uh, collection mechanism. So our regular um, rear loader trucks we're using to collect uh, curbside organics. Um, we also run seasonal composting, which is part of curbside collection. Uh, we collect Christmas trees, we collect fall leaves, um, and sometimes the department helps collect um, you know, from special NYC compost project events, um, like pumpkin smash, we run it, you know, in all five boroughs trying to divert pumpkins from landfill disposal after Halloween. And it's kind of a fun post Halloween event. Um, and we run leaf rakes, the NYC compost project runs leaf rakes uh, during the fall to engage New Yorkers in diverting leaves from landfill disposal. Um, and all of this is converted into finished compost, um, which we make available to residents, city agencies, and nonprofits uh, for gardening, soil mitigation, street tree stewardship, or habitat improvement projects. So this is really our primary carrot for encouraging participation in the program. It's like, you know, the miracle of black gold. Um, in addition to curbside composting, we have what we call drop-off composting. And so residents can bring their food scraps to a drop-off site and have that material uh, composted. You know, if they can't, if they are not eligible for curbside service. Um, as of now, we have more drop-off sites than we've ever had. We have over 200. Um, and I actually didn't include smart composting in this, but um, we have 30 uh, smart composting bins, which are accessed uh, via either an app or a, um, what do you call those access cards? A special access card, like when you swipe into a building, they're available 24 seven and, and we're in expanding the smart composting program uh, next fiscal year. So we will, we will definitely be increasing our drop-off sites around the city exponentially in FY23. Um, a, Little community engagement in uh, helping to grow drop-off sites is really important. So this started when uh, the curbside composting program, um, you know, we were rolling out citywide to collect organics from 44 community boards. And we were trying to encourage um, sites that were eligible to enroll in curbside to also host a drop-off. So if you're in a community garden, um, in a neighborhood that gets curbside, could you help us and put a brown bin out there for your residents that you know somehow don't aren't eligible for curbside or didn't sign up for curbside, whatever the reason may be, um, and put a brown bin out and we will collect um, and compost that material. Um, there are also community compost sites that you know e this started even before the department. You know, basically, I would say this is kind of the earliest iteration of composting in New York City, where community gardens, community groups were took it upon themselves to start composting in New York City and accept from the neighborhood and use the finished compost, you know, for neighborhood greening and gardening projects. So we now have a more structured me way, method of um, 
incorporating sites into the program, into the drop-off program. And, and the reason being is that this is about citywide access. So we don't want someone to bring their food scraps to a location only to get there and it's closed or it's not open. So you have to have a certain number of open hours, um, be willing to accept from the public. You need to post a public drop-off sign like you see here. Um, and you need to, you know, be responsive to us within X and up 24 hours. Um, if there's an issue, like if it's snow, you know, let us know if you're closed, things of that nature. Um, so over 50% of our food scrap drop-offs right now, food scrap drop-off sites are community hosted. So it's a really, um, it's a really relies a lot on community partnerships um, for its existence, the drop-off program. And then community composting, um, and this is really um, the work of the NYC Compost Project, which is the basically foundational composting program of the Department of Sanitation. Um, so basically the Compost Project supports community compost sites in New York City um, to care for green spaces, demonstrate how to compost, and provide opportunities for communities to make compost locally. Um, the NYC Compost Project is housed in all five boroughs, and um, they collectively we work with over 200 community compost sites throughout the city. Um, and the NYC Compost Project also operates six mid-scale community compost sites that are registered with uh, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, it was founded in 1993 by the Department of Sanitation. And the goal was to rebuild New York City soils by providing New Yorkers with the knowledge, skills, and opportunities they need to produce and use compost locally. Um, our programs, NYC Compost Project programs, are carried out by uh, seven uh, compost project teams at, the, at uh, seven partner organizations. I hope I'm not going too fast. I can't see any faces, it's a little weird. A little odd. I don't know what folks are, but I can't doing questions at the end. You're doing great, Debbie. Okay, thank you. Um, the compost project went through several phases of development. Um, the beginning was a really focused on backyard composting. You know, um, providing bins low, low, free or at low cost to New York City residents that had a backyard, um, and it was you know just basic outreach and education. Sorry, I'm on a compost call. Thank you so much. I got my iCall posters. Thank God, we have a big event tomorrow. I just got my iCall posters, everyone. Um, then in the early uh, 2000s, um, we were really ramping up the program. We were building the network. Um, we, were, we started the Master Composter Certificate course. Um, which is the train the trainer program. I'll get into it a little bit more. Um, and we were building, starting our work really working with community compost sites around the around the city and starting to expand from working backyard and home composting to really what is community composting? What does it need to provide some real technical support? Um, we were getting more and more asked to really help people compost locally because there was no curbside composting option in New York City. Um, and then um, in some master composters, some community composters basically were demanding of composting options. Uh, so we started, you know, funding through Grow NYC, which is separate from this, the drop off program. Uh, Grow NYC is not part of the NYC compost project, but is one of the key partners uh, that we work with to run food scrap drop-off sites at green markets throughout the city. So it was a kind of locked in audience of people who were interested in local food, local agriculture, and understood kind of the import of um, buying local, um, supporting local food production, and also trying to compost the organics, you know, from, from local food stuff uh, at, bring it back to green markets and have it composted locally. Um, so we started expanding drop off um, with Grow NYC, um, and then we started a operational arm of the NYC Compost Project, 
um, which I'll get into a little bit more, which, which is the mid-scale compost educational facilities in 2012. Um, and then we got, we expand, we continue to expand uh, educational opportunities and um, drop-off opportunities. So backyard and home, home composting, you can see this is like worm bin, um, a basic, you know, um, garden gourmet or a tumbler, some of your basic backyard composting uh, tools that we would give out and educate folks on how do you make them and use them. Um, and uh, we started with homeowners. And as, as I mentioned earlier in the earlier slide, um, continued to expand to reach a variety of different audiences to expand. Uh, awareness and participation in composting throughout New York City. Okay, next slide. Um, these are the original um, NYC Compost Project partners. So originally we started um, with the botanical gardens um, and um, later incorporated the Lower East Side Ecology Center. So we had a Manhattan arm because there's no botanical garden in the city. Um, at the time, the, in the early 90s, the New York City Department of Sanitation, we conducted a study um, to figure out who would compost in New York City. We conducted a number of different pilot, composting pilots uh, where we collected curbside. And the main thing that we learned was A, participation, participation in setting out curbside was highly variable, quite difficult in high rises. And um, however, the audiences that were interested and amenable and had a history of participating in composting were those that were gardeners, you know, that were interested in greening and gardening because they understood the use of finished compost. So we developed a unique partnership with um, the Department of Cultural Affairs that oversees uh, the botanical gardens throughout the city to run the NYC compost project through the botanical gardens. They kind of had a captive audience of folks interested in greening and gardening. Uh, as I said, we, you know, as we grew and as there were more um, community compost sites, uh, community gardens that were interested in really composting on site, and as New Yorkers in general really wanted to compost locally, as the, the interest and the drive around sustainability grew on a national level, I would really say, we, um, we expanded the NYC Compost Project to have an operational arm. Um, and we brought in Earth Matter, um, Big Reuse, and started funding uh, the operational work of the Lower East Side Ecology Center. So up until 2012, we were funding the Ecology Center to do outreach and education and worm shops, um, selling low cost bins, but now we started funding them to run the drop-offs and process organics. Um, what are all the different program areas of the NYC Compost Project? Um, we do public outreach and engagement. We do education. We run the Master Composter Certificate course. We provide technical assistance to community compost sites. We have composting operations um, and we do compost distribution. Um, here's a little idea of what public outreach and engagement looks like, having volunteers work at a compost site um, getting their hands dirty, turning compost. Uh, next slide. We provide tours, so we bring school groups and community groups, like this is what happens to your food scraps. Um, people of all backgrounds are always wowed. I am still wowed, years later, I'm always wowed by the thermometer. Um, technical assistance to community compost sites. We do bin builds, sifter builds, um, we do, you know, uh, we send master composters to do volunteer work days at those community compost sites. Um, we do sifting days. We do, uh, we provide browns, we provide tools. Next slide. Um, we do education, so straight up workshops, and we have a range of uh, print materials that we provide. Um, we try and get things in the, in the news. Um, sometimes we, um, you know, sometimes uh, 
we try and have some carrots around our educational workshops, providing compost to get difficult audiences, like audiences that we don't normally reach to attend by providing compost or things of that nature. We try and do these workshops in multiple languages. Uh, our signature course, the Master Composter Certificate Program, um, we run, um, so we used to run this one, in, one course per borough each year, and there's there was such a tremendous demand for it um, that we are now running it year round, and all the partners are offering workshops and training on the Master Composter Certificate course um, year round, and volunteer opportunities are year round, and field trips are year round. Um, so you have to do, uh, maybe go to the next slide. I think I have it on there. Yeah. Um, so it's basically 24 hours of classroom instruction, two field trips, um, 30 hours of compost related volunteer hours. Um, in order to become a certified master composter. Um, and this is really gets, enables us to um, access communities, you know, all over the city where we might not have special language skills or cultural fluencies. It's really a critical program for the department. Um, it also teaches people the basics of how to make compost. Um, okay, we'll keep going. We can go on, it's okay. Okay, um, yeah, so they, they learn, how, you know, master composters, they learn how to make and use compost. Uh, they learn about all um, the Bureau of Recycling and Sustainability programs, um, learn how to answer questions about composting and recycling so they can set up info tables at a, at a, a community event. Um, and they also volunteer, um, at compost project and Department of Sanitation events. So we run big citywide compost distribution events. Um, currently, we're doing a lot of canvassing around the curbside composting program. So master composters can even volunteer to canvas neighborhoods um, to increase sign up in the curbside program. Okay. Um, okay, we can skip this one. I think I covered it. Um, here's a little view of just master composters all over the city. Um, here's tabling, processing organics, doing something in a classroom, a little um, people do composting puppet shows, um, processing in a community garden, sifting with the community, or setting up the brown bin service at a church or a community center. And then in 2012, here's our composting operations that we move to um, support. This is uh, NYC compost project, project hosted by Queens Botanical Garden. Let's go to the next slide. Um, here's the East River Park compost yard operated by the NYC compost project hosted by the Lower East Side Ecology Center. The next slide. This is, um, this is Queens Botanical Garden farm and compost. Um, we also help support the Queens Botanical Garden Farm to show kind of the connection between food waste and food production. Next slide. Um, we support the Compost Learning Center on Governor's Island, um, accepting and processing food scraps um, and running volunteer days and tours on Governor's Island. Next slide. Um, we, uh, we, uh, this, this was a great initiative. Um, it was initially a participatory budgeting um, proposal by a master composter. So if you, if you live in a community that has participatory budgeting, it's when community members get to vote on how they allocate um, municipal funds. They voted to expand composting um, in what, what BK6, which is Park Slope, Gowanus, Red Hook area. Um, they, community composters at the time were, uh, we allowed them to function on a DSNY salt lot. So part of the lot we use for salt storage during snow season, because we clear the snow. Um, at the time they had a three bin system. Um, with the PB funding and with additional DSNY support, we built a three bin bunker bay system for big reuse. Um, and they are operating at the BK6 salt lot. 
And uh, yeah, I'll turn it over to Renee. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, happy to continue the story here. But um, so my name is Renee Crowley, Deputy Director of the Lower East Side Ecology Center. And um, we are a nonprofit organization based in New York City, where beyond community composting, we provide programs in electronics recycling, stewardship of green spaces, and environmental education. Um, our work began in 1987 when a group of volunteers offered a free drop-off program for metal glass paper before the city's recycling program was in place. Um, and, and we really found that yeah, community-based recycling was like a core, core value of the, the work that we wanted to continue doing. Um, next slide. So um, to accommodate the growth of the recycling program, we leased four vacant city lots that were owned by the city and entered into our first like formal agreement with, with the local government. Um, this space not only allowed us to grow our uh, MGP recycling program, but it gave us the space to expand into community composting. So next slide. Our composting program was incredibly local. Food scraps were dropped off by at, at the garden by neighbors. We also picked up other organics from nearby juice bars and food stores. And we made small little windrows and used the finished compost to build up the health of the soil in these vacant lots and transformed these lots into gardens. And, and so really leaned into uh, of showcasing the, the way you can recycle your food scraps and build healthy communities. Um, and here are some fun pictures of the Lower East Side back then. Uh, yeah, there we go again. <laughs> All right, you can go to the next slide. Um, then uh, through a partnership with what is now called Grow NYC that Debbie mentioned earlier, a, a, another nonprofit that runs the Green Market Program in New York City and, and much, much more, um, we expanded and launched, launched one of the city's first food scrap collection sites at the Union Square Farmers Market, which if you haven't been to, I highly recommend you visit New York and stop by the Union Square Farmers Markets. It's one of the biggest and busiest and has uh, an amazing array of, of local agricultural pr providers uh, uh, selling their goods. Um, and when we expanded here, it really uh, grew the amount of food scraps that we were collecting and also provided an outlet for us to sell the compost that we were making, uh, make a potting soil product that we were also selling and use that booth as a real tool to educate people on, on composting and waste reduction. Next slide. Then uh, as our, with all this growth and simultaneously in the late 90s, gentrification and development was happening in the Lower East Side, um, we needed space to continue our composting program at the scale that we were receiving materials. Um, so we entered into a license agreement with the New York City Parks Department to bring our composting program to East River Park, which is um, less than a mile away from where we were currently located. Um, and it was really through this partnership with the Parks Department that we were able to expand um, our composting programs. We incorporated leaves from East River Park into the piles. And this license agreement um, gave us a space at no cost, uh, and um, but like in exchange, we were carrying out programs and services that benefit the public. Um, so this slide that we're on right now is kind of showcasing the next big milestone in our partnerships with the city in carrying out composting programs. So like Debbie was talking about earlier, in 2005, uh, the Ecology Center became host site for the Department of Sanitation's New York City Compost Project. And at this time, the funding uh, provided uh, support to hire uh, about like one to two staff and provided funds to carry out compost education, master composter trainings, and provide support to other small scale community composters across Manhattan. So you can see here, building compost bins, 
um, providing kind of uh, poster resources so that as people participated at these compost sites, you can know what you can and cannot drop off. Um, and uh, you can go to the next slide. Then the next big step uh, also in 2012, when the New York City Compost Project scope expanded to include food scrap drop-off sites, um, it gave us another kind of burst of funding for personnel where we were able to add two additional staff to the team and had funds to purchase equipment that we needed to run sites like a truck, the, the bins to collect the food scraps and all the, the little things that you need to run a food scrap collection program. So it allowed us to um, uh, start to offer other food scrap drop-off sites in the Lower East Side, uh, kind of expanding within a one to two mile radius of where our processing site was in East River Park. So next slide. Uh, so basically throughout the past 10 years, we've continued to expand um, on these programs in food scrap collection, processing, donating compost, and carrying out education and outreach. Um, and our footprint has grown beyond the Lower East Side, and we serve, um, provide these services to all of Manhattan. And even over the last year, we've started to run food scrap drop-off sites and programming in parts of Brooklyn as well. Um, so I love these collection of pictures just showing the team here and the scope of the work that we've been carrying out most recently. Uh, and here's just kind of a snapshot of where we are today. Um, we're currently operating nearly 30 drop-off sites, collecting over one and a half million pounds of food scraps, and really uh, connecting over a thousand people each year through our education and outreach programs. And all of this work is carried out by uh, the employment of eight full-time and four part-time staff. So in summary, um, over the past 35 years, government support has allowed the Ecology Center to really grow its programs in many ways, whether through just direct land access agreements or funding that supports the personnel costs and operating expenses. And then the last two bullet points, I didn't really touch on too much, but if folks have questions, we can dive into this. But the support of our local elected officials has also been um, tremendously important in one, advocating for maintaining funding streams and also maintaining access to, to, to the lands that we're running our composting programs on. So I will pass it on to Devin to do a deep dive into Big Reefs. All right, thanks, Renee and, and Debbie, and uh, to Brendan IL, ILSR for, for hosting this. My name is Devin Wrights. I'm the project manager of the New York City Compost Project, hosted by Big Reuse. And I'm going to tell a somewhat similar story to Renee um, and talk about what, what's possible, kind of a before and after uh, municipal funding with um, composting in Western Queens. So our program, our compost project kind of started um, outside of big reuse and um, outside of DSNY's purview entirely. Uh, well, not entirely, I shouldn't say. It, it was started by uh, several master composters who, who graduated from the master composter course at Queens Botanical Garden in 2007. Um, they were working uh, at a community garden in Astoria, Queens, and you know, convinced the garden to build a three bin system. And, and with that, uh, the Western Queens Compost Initiative was started. Um, you can go to the next slide. And so, yeah, between 2007 and 2011, the Western Queens Compost Initiative partnered with Queens Libraries um, and, and had some grants through a few different sources to to start collecting food scraps at uh, several Queens Public Libraries. They sort of expanded to to you know collect elsewhere, um, and they processed this material in in a really decentralized way at multiple partner sites, um, such as Brooklyn Grange, which is a rooftop um, farm in Long Island City, the aforementioned Two Coves Community Garden. Uh, a larger three-bin system at Socrates Sculpture Park came online, 
and and a some some tumblers and a, a three bin system at Sunnyside Community Garden. Um, in two by 2011, the Western Queens Compost Initiative was diverting more than 80,000 pounds of material from the landfill. That was about 45,000 pounds of, of food scraps and roughly 30,000 pounds of, of parks, department leaves and wood chips from local area parks. Next slide. And yeah, these are some photos of these decentralized processing sites. Um, this is two coves in Brooklyn Grange on top, two coves on the bottom. Um, and yeah, you can kind of see the scale that uh, the Western Queens Compost Initiative um, was was working at prior to to municipal funding. Um, you know, it it large you know tumblers three bin systems still doing a lot of material because they had systems kind of scattered throughout Western Queens. But as you'll see later, uh, you know, kind of pales in comparison to to where we are now, just kind of ten years after joining DSNY. Next slide. Um, so yeah, in the spring of 2012, the Western Compost Initiative, which was um, sort of housed at Build It Green, which is what Big Reuse used to be called, joined DSNY's Local Organics Recovery Program, which is uh, something both Renee and Debbie uh, mentioned in their part. Um, it, was, it was kind of that large expansion uh, of the compost project in 2011-2012 where sort of more more operations began uh, being funded by DSNY um, and DSNY's support along with some remaining grant funding and and some support from Big Reuse itself allowed uh, the Western Queens Compost Initiative now the New York City Compost Project hosted by Big Reuse to expand um, number of food scrap drop-offs from six to 14 um, and processed an average of 5,000 pounds of food scraps per week in 2013. So sort of starting to, you know, the funding allowed for more food scraps to, go, to be collected and that increased collection of food scraps sort of prompted uh, the need for just a much greater uh, amount of processing capacity. And so similar to the Lower Side Ecology Center, uh, Big Reuse was able to secure space underneath the Queensboro Bridge in Long Island City, Queens, um, to expand processing capacity. And it, you know, similar to the Lower East Side Ecology Center, it was sort of a underutilized plot of land that was underneath a bridge and will never become a public park as a re result of its location. Um, and part of the deal was to help to work with New York City Parks Department in Queens to increase the amount of material they were composting as well. So collecting residential food scraps, mixing them with um, leaves and wood chips from parks was, was kind of the model that, that continues today. Next slide. And so this is the, the sort of early years of the Queensbridge Community Compost Site um, underneath the Queensboro Bridge. You can kind of see the bridge footings there and, and Manhattan in the background. Early on, it was, um, you know, we were we were processing a lot of material, but it was very sort of volunteer with pitchfork style um, windrow builds. Uh, that was kind of the composting technology we were using to, to start out um, in the, the early years under the bridge. Next slide. And you know, as DSNY funding continued for big reuse, we were able to secure more and more um, equipment and composting technology, uh, which just further, you know, increased the the volume of material collected. Um, and so you see on the left, this is, uh, you know, in the in the foreground, there's the compost text cover on some older material, more mature material. In the background, we were donated a they partially donated a, a sustainable generation score cover um, to to cover our our fresh um, fresh builds and reduce odors and just better sort of manage and produce better compost. So, and then on the right, we were able to get a get a skid steer among 
among a lot of other equipment, um, you know, box truck, the toters you see in the background are not cheap. All of this stuff is, you know, became possible with with um, consistent and in some ways increasing DSNY funding for for the sites and food scrap drop offs. Next slide. Um, so d due to some parks operational needs and just us outgrowing that sort of more informal space underneath the Queensboro Bridge, um, which was really just an asphalt pad that we overlaid uh, some aerated static piles onto. Um, and as we collected more and more material, we um, you know, sort of outgrew it. And so with DSNY funding, and parks department support we were able to move really just two blocks down the street in the same parks department compound underneath the queensboro bridge and open a new sort of intentional compost site which you'll see some pictures of in a second um, this aerial photo on the right i think kind of can show the uh all that's there you know our screener our skid steer our j lore our phase one and two bays and and the volume of compost that we're we're sort of producing um you can see below it's like 1.3 million pounds of material in fiscal year 18 and then last fiscal year we did 1.5 million pounds at this site um, the photo on the left is is kind of the ribbon cutting of of this site with then dsmy commissioner catherine garcia looking very happy she did, she did wear her heels on top of the pile. Yeah, yeah, she's brave. Um, but you can go to the next slide. And so, yeah, the, the next few slides are just photos of the composting technology um, that is possible with DSNY funding. You can see it's kind of more, looks like an intentional compost site with the, those bunker walls and bays. Um, the gore, you have, you can go back to the last slide. Sorry, the you know we have a new skid steer, toter tipper. That's that yellow thing in the center of the photo, and now two gore covers. So one for phase one and one for one for phase two. Um, and here we're turning phase two into phase three. You can kind of get a sense of the the volume uh, being put through this fifteen thousand square foot compost site. Uh, next slide. And at, as Debbie already mentioned, uh, in 2017, we opened a second site in Brooklyn, um, which came through participatory budgeting money, as well as some master composter work and advocacy to, to make it happen. It's a totally different composting system than the one we have in Long Island City. It's uh, two sets of four aerated bays. Uh, it's close to a Superfund site. It, it's on a Superfund site, I should say. And therefore, uh, we really need to make sure no rainwater was contacting the compost. And that's why it sort of looks like a, you know, a bomb shelter there. But it's, you know, everything is, is covered from rainwater. There's solar panels on the roof. Um, and you can see, you know, it, the, the amount of material, the amount of throughput at, at that site over last year and the projections for this year. Um, and that site is in Gowanus, Brooklyn. Next slide. Um, again, just illustrating the, you know, the scale of what we're doing and and the um, the equipment that's possible with DSNY funding. Uh, next slide. And then something I haven't necessarily mentioned, just kind of focused on the the processing sites. Uh, we but something Brenda mentioned early on in the introductions is we have over. 70 uh, food scrap drop-offs throughout Bronx, Brooklyn, and the Queen and Queens. The purple dots are where our compost sites are located. Um, the remaining dots are um, the location of our food scrap drop-offs. And you know, with DSNY support over the years, we've been able to procure um, two box trucks, a dump truck, you know, the toters, everything else needed to support this pretty large network of um, community-hosted food scrap drop-offs. And they're largely located at community gardens, but you know there are a lot of different types of um, community partners in this network. Um, 
And as Debbie mentioned, it kind of was started with, with the brown bin program. And um, when, when that was paused during the COVID budget cuts, uh, we, we sort of jumped in and, and started hauling from, from a lot of these partners and many new partners. Um, and this program was also supported uh, in, in a huge way by a USDA grant that uh, we were able to, to secure during um, the, the COVID pause in, in, in composting in New York City in, in 2020. Um, and yeah, next slide. So the, what all of the compost produced at, at all of the compost project sites, not just ours, is sort of earmarked for public greening projects. Um, you can see here a bagging volunteer day and uh, the compost distribution event on the right. So, you know, kind of what Debbie was talking about in the hierarchy of composting, you know, we keep the, the real value in these sites and the food scrap drop-offs and you know the the closing of the loop with compost distribution is that all this material stays locally and just goes right back into the soil in in our case largely to uh, western queens parks and community gardens in in brooklyn bronx and the queens and and queens um and yeah in, in total we at big reuse are are distributing you know over 500 cubic yards of compost each year for free to you know, farms, gardens, parks, schools uh, to to use for for a whole number of projects. Um, and I think that's the last slide. Or Debbie, you're jumping in on this one. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, you know, basically the Department of Sanitation believes a, a multi-tiered organics diversion strategy that includes both curbside, community, drop-off composting, as well as backyard composting and home composting is needed uh, to divert material from landfill disposal and offer a more sustainable method of waste management here. Um, there are more people, programs, organizations, and institutions involved in composting because of the work of the compost project really allows people to get hands-on experience, uh, see the miracle of composting locally. So even um, even if you know this is not the tonnage diversion, a it shows. Uh, is there one more slide after this? I think I wrote something else. Right. This is this is kind of the sustainability ideal. So residents can experience some level of what a closed loop regional waste management system would look like. And we will always have New Yorkers who, even if they have access to curbside, will want to know that that material is being composted locally. And the compost project does that. Um, it also, you know, just builds public understanding by allowing people to tour a community compost site, um, mid-scale compost educational facility that shows them what it can look like um, and how you can turn food waste into uh, finished compost. And it also offers ways to get involved in a, in a more ongoing way. If you, um, if you really want to do hands-on greening and gardening in New York, Yes, you can do a, you know, join a community garden, but you could also volunteer at a community compost site and turn compost or sift compost or accept leaves or accept, you know, food scraps from the public um, and make and use finished compost locally. So um, we, we, we deeply believe in the program. Um, we found participation in curbside has grown in areas that have a lot of uh, master composters that have a lot of drop off opportunities. So it, it's really full wraparound composting on all levels um, and, and community composting and the NYC compost project really, um, uh, Commissioner Gar former Commissioner Garcia called it the retail arm of composting in New York City. It really shows kind of um, highlights, you know, what, what residents can do um, in their own communities. So um, thanks for, for giving us an opportunity to talk a bit about the program. Awesome. Thank you, Debbie, Renee, and, and uh, Devin. Um, and uh, Clarissa is going to bring up, since we don't have our webcams working today, we're going to, we have the photos of you, of all of you. So we'll get that slide up when we get a chance. And uh, we'll, we have plenty of time now for questions and answers. For those of you participating, feel free to type your questions into the GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll see 
if we how many we can get to i'll just say not all compost is created equal um and from the photos at least uh it looks like you guys are producing amazing amazing compost black gold and i think just to reflecting on some of the things you shared is new york city is an interesting model a great model of showing how you're supporting existing sites doing the work rather than replacing them um, and debbie as you just underscored the diversified strategy it's not just the home composting the drop-off and the citywide access and curbside but by having these local sites you're creating places where you can do education and bring youth groups and do tours and each of the host sites that that you're supporting directly are then supporting additional community-based sites with their technical assistance and build building bin building and as we all know new york has a um, diverse population of folks speaking many languages and i'm sure people would like to hear more about the multiple languages. I think you mentioned your master compost or some of the education is in many languages. We'll get to that. You don't have to answer that now, but if you have thoughts on that, put a pin in that. Um, and uh, one thing, I'm not sure it came out so clear, but um, uh, one of our participants wanted Debbie you to underscore this, is that the Department of Sanitation services all multi-residential -resi buildings, which quote he thought is unique to New York City. Do you have a, Debbie, do you have a comment on, on that piece? And again, if we keep our answers short, we'll get to more questions, but maybe you have something to say about the reaching, giving access to everybody in the city. Yeah, I mean, our, our organics program does have the challenge, our curbside composting program has the challenge of high rises, which is pretty much one of the dominant um, housing structures in the city. Um, I think, most municipalities that have a curbside program it's not a it's still kind of the difficult nut to crack um and um i i would to be honest say that we haven't fully um figured out that you know how to uh how to fully crack that nut of buildings of 50 units or more or 10 units or more um you have to get building management, building super, or someone on the co-op board to um, to approve your um, participation in the curbside program because it's not like residents are bringing material curbside; they're dumping in a hopper, and then the super or the porter or the, or, um, is bringing the material to the curb. So you need the management to say yes, we're willing to participate in this program. So where 60% of I think it's anywhere from 60, it might be 80% of, of New Yorkers are renters. Um, that adds a complicated factor to our curbside composting program. And that's why the drop-off program um, is kind of flourishing as it is, because we have a lot of residents who want to participate, but their building management um, won't necessarily sign up. So I appreciate you saying you think we've figured it out. I don't, I don't, I, um, I think we have ideas but i don't i definitely would not say we've 100 percent figured it out right um to back up a, to back up a little bit on the new york's nyc compost project here's a question that came in hi just to clarify is the project by the city called quote nyc compost project unquote and the partners are low east side ecology center and big reuse so debbie it's much bigger than just your two partners can you talk just clarify that yeah, so um, the community composting program is called the NYC Compost Project. And all the host sites are, it's NYC Compost Project hosted by dot, dot, dot. So there was one slide that um, said NYC Compost Project hosted by Big Reuse, NYC Compost Project hosted by Brooklyn Botanic Garden, NYC Compost Project hosted by Lower Side Ecology Center. So you know, it's one project within their broader organizations, and that's the community, that's the city's community composting. Um, right. And how, you know, you have these host sites, I think there's about half a dozen, six or seven. And of course, I think uh, you mentioned there's more than 200 community based composters, mostly at gar community gardens throughout throughout the city. How did you select 
you know, what was the process for selecting those half dozen or so? And why is it constrained to just those? And I, I have and, and tie that into like the mid scale compost composting sites you're supporting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I think I, I mentioned this earlier, but not not sure if folks got it. But in, in the early days, basically in the 90s, uh, we ran some composting pilots um, to try and see would New Yorkers source separate um, and set out at the curb. And uh, we did not feel that there were, that we had the numbers to go citywide on a composting program. Uh, based on kind of these pilots, they they uh, we ran them in different um, different community boards in the city. Some that were low rise, um, and some that were high rise. Um, and we just we we never got the tonnage that we needed to to uh, run a citywide program at that time. So, um, but what we did learn was that um, those who did participate um, were you know, and those who were interested in participating and were interested in expanding the program were people who are gardeners who had an understanding of uh, compost as a resource. And so we decided that rather than kind of, you know, start from scratch and create constituency, you know, on our own of interested parties, why don't we work with, say, you know, um, the New York Botanical Garden had something called Bronx Green Up, where they uh, supported community gardeners and community um, greening folks in the Bronx. And Brooklyn Botanic Garden had something called Brooklyn Greenbridge. Um, Queens Botanical Garden had something similar, and Snug Harbor had something similar. So we worked with um, the greening and gardening programs that the Botanical Gardens offered. They had an established constituency, and to be honest, um, the Department of Sanitation was not seen as like so kind of warm and fuzzy as the botanicals. Um, so they had kind of more reach into those communities. They already had networks. Um, and so we started, um, we work with the Department of Cultural Affairs that oversees all the city's botanical gardens. And we crafted an MOU with the Department of Cultural Affairs where we would fund the botanicals uh, through the Department of Cultural Affairs. So the, the uh, botanical gardens are considered living museums, which is why they're part of cultural affairs. Um, and we started funding the compost project through those four botanical gardens. Um, I think Renee you know, shared, I can't even remember the exact date, Renee, but there's no botanical garden in Manhattan. Um, and the Lower East Side Ecology Center um, really was the one doing outreach and education around composting in the city. Um, so then we, we developed a partnership um, with the Lower East Side Ecology Center to be the Manhattan arm of the compost project. Um, and at that time, um, you know, they were called the Brooklyn Compost Project, the Manhattan Compost Project, Queens Compost Project, everyone was called, you know, the borough based compost project. Um, then we you know, we, we wanted it to be seen as a citywide program, so we changed the nomenclature to the NYC Compost Project citywide. Um, as people were clamoring for more overt diversion opportunities, we were looking to grow the compost project, and master composters were starting these amazing programs. There was Western Queens Compost Initiative, there was also Red Hook Farm going on where there was uh, mid-scale composting starting to take place. Um, there was a lot of different initiatives popping up around the city, the green market program, uh, the material was being processed at community gardens and community uh, composters were hauling scraps and doing a rotation to process material from the green markets. Um, so we basically brought in, in, in like 2011, all the large scale processors. Um, and, and it was pretty obvious who they were um, in terms of the network, in terms of the the amount of material that they could process. Um, and, and we visited all the sites um, and we just started some conversations. Um, and eventually we crafted what, what Devin uh, referenced as the Local Organics Recovery Program, um, which was a program of the NYC Compost Project. So that was, we brought on Big Reuse, um, um, Earth Matter, and expanded our partnership with the Lower East Side Ecology Center um, and also started funding BBG to do work at Red Hook Community Farm 
to expand drop-offs and expand processing. Uh, because these were the people who, who were doing it, who were already working on it, and we wanted to kind of support that work that was already going on. Um, and many of those initiatives had been started by master composters. Yeah, and BBG folks, that's the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry. No, you're good. Hey, let's bring Renee and Devin into the conversation. So Renee, I'll, I'll start with you. How, this is kind of an obvious question maybe, but how would you be operating, you know, in terms of the composting part of the Lower East, Lower East Side Ecology Center's activities? How, how would you be able to operate without city support? How important is this direct city funding? Yeah, thanks. Um, so without the city support, we would really need to revisit and kind of re-examine uh, the scope of our work and our reach and kind of rethink our funding because the way it is right now, almost, uh, almost entirely our compost program is funded by the Department of Sanitation. Um, there would, we got like a little taste of this in 2020 when COVID hit, uh, when there was a like a few months where we, we lost our funding because of the loss of uh, just city money going through uh, all the different agencies um, and so we kind of momentarily scaled back our drop-off sites um, and and yeah just kind of yeah scaled everything back essentially and so I think if, if there wasn't the city funding we wouldn't be able to do what we would, what we're doing now. And um, I think one thing to point out for folks, uh, if it if it didn't hit already, in New York City, uh, trash collect, like trash and recycling, is paid for by taxpayer monies, and so it's not like a direct utility that you can choose who your curbside waste hauler is. And I think that makes it really challenging for for other community composters to like run a residential curbside uh, food scrap pickup program because New Yorkers aren't used to like paying for that waste service. And so it would be a real big challenge um, for us to like just start like charging New Yorkers for uh, like charging a fee to pick up their food scraps because that's just not part of the the culture, the expectations of waste collection in, in New York City. Yeah, good point. And Devin, same question for you. I mean, what, how critical is city funding to your operations? Not only your ongoing operations, but you showed, you know, a lot of equipment and, you know, site expansion and moving and the access to land. Yeah. Um... I, you know, similar to, to what Renee was saying, we would really have to look at what's possible. You know, I mentioned this USDA grant that kind of came out of that few months pause in 2020 during the COVID budget cuts. Um, but it was not a, you know, as great as that grant is, it's not. it was not a full replacement for a year of DSNY funding for the compost project. And so the idea there was maybe it could keep the lights on at our sites and we could have a few food scrap drop offs and seek other grants or yeah, do a fee for service type collection um, that, that Renee mentioned. Um, so, you know, most of our budget does go to personnel um, for, to pay people to collect and process. The waste and do outreach and education around our sites and food scrap drop-offs. So you know it would be hard to sustain the level of programming that we have without DSNY support. Um, and I think the program, the really nice thing about DSNY funding and being part of the New York City Compost Project is that it is one sort of holistic program with you know collective goals that you know allow us to. I think concentrate resources on, on certain goals when I think when you're, you know, independently funding a project like this from different grant sources, public or private, it can kind of become this patchwork program that, you know, is tailor made to, to fit certain, certain grants or something like that. And so I think what would be lost without DSY funding is also the 
sort of you know decades long for bigger use at least decades long you know goal of expanding and, and promoting composting in New York City um, because we would just become this fractalized collection of composters again. And Devin that is such a good point I think this is something that you know Debbie and, and Department of Sanitation the New York City Compost Project does so well as that overall branding you know it's the New York City Compost Project hosted by and it's not just big big reuse or Lower East Side Ecology Center it's Earth Matter it's a bunch of other sites the master composter program the outreach and marketing and um, you know graphics and all that is is all branded under this one project so you know, if you're just a little site and you're doing the master composter program, your program is being amplified by this common branding that the local government is providing. I don't know, Renee or, or Debbie, if you have any other thoughts to add to that that important point. Renee, start with you. Yeah, if we had our cameras, I have my branded hats uh, from the different brands throughout the years that I was going to show you all. Um, but yeah it really creates um i mean it can sometimes be a little confusing like kind of how the one of those first questions it's like clarifying what is the compost project is it city or is it nonprofit run um but kind of once you get the grasp of it you understand the network of the host sites and the, the ripple effect of the sites that the other community sites that the host sites support and um, it just kind of weaves together a, a common story that we're trying yeah. to tell. Yeah, and it, it, it's exciting because we have, um, as a celebration of ICAL and a celebration of volunteers um, who've been supporting the drop-off network, for example, we, we're having a little gathering tomorrow night um, at a Grow NYC space project farmhouse. Um, you know, and it, just to have all the partners together with um, representatives, you know, from all the compost project sites, but also with community composters, um, citywide attending, it, it really build, builds a sense of cohesion and a network. And I think uh, Renee referenced it in her in the her final two bullets and didn't get too deep into it, but. Um, you know, this is a Department of Sanitation program, but there is, you know, kind of legislation and policy and advocates. And, and what we're trying to do is create people who under really deeply understand composting and the import of the program for New York City sustainability goals um, and are committed to it. And, and it's these folks who really keep the lights turned on uh, for composting programs in the city. There's been many efforts to, to cut composting um, through various administrations. And it's really the people who've come through these programs who continue to advocate um, and demand that the city, you know, maintain composting as a critical part of our sustainability agenda. Yeah, and Debbie, that may have just answered this one question I was going to ask you next. When securing funding, who, what is your single largest advocate? Who, what is your single largest hurdle? Mm. Our single largest advocate. Um, is this question to me? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, to all of us, it, I mean, we I can we can I mean, have Renee and Devin answer too, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think what we saw so, you know, I think COVID was a big challenge. Um, and, um, you know, critical city funding was diverted for emergency food and other really, um, you know, health and hospital type emergency pandemic needs. Um, and we and we did lose a lot of funding. Um, but a, a whole new grass, grassroots network emerged. Um, that was, so we, you know, we have all the compost project partners, but um, the city also has um, a solid waste advisory board in each borough. Um, and they're supposed to advise the, um, the sanitation committee for city council. So it was the swabs, you know, it's like there's a Brooklyn swab, queen swab, and then, um, so, so they're advisors or advocates, um, and then community composters coupled with the swabs. Um, you know, we our partners, we we can't lobby, we can't, you know, advocate. That's we're funded by the mayor, so that's not our role. But um, but community partners can, um, and they can 
share about how important this program is to them and what this program has meant to them and their communities. And what we saw was hearing after hearing of community members who got up and talked about how this changed their relationship to their neighborhood, to their, you know, having a green space, having a garden space, having a place where they could compost, um, having a place where they could drop off, having access to the service, you know, um, how, how NYCHA public housing was impacted by um, Hurricane Sandy and how composting um, reduces greenhouse gases and mitigates the impact on climate change. We really had community members standing up. I mean, literally hours and hours of testimony. And to be honest, that's just 30 years of the city putting in the work. Like I'm not, you know, this is the work of the compost project, the work of all the partners and master composters. It's just time. It's just time for the message to sink in. And, and it was, it's very like moving to hear people, you know, just speak about the program and the impact of the program year after yeah. year. Well, we have only just a few minutes left. So um, one of the, we're not gonna get to everybody's questions, our apologies. I'm focusing on questions related to government support, the city's support of community composters. We have questions around food packaging and contamination and the smart uh, composting collection bins. Um, we're not gonna get to those, but let me just ask, we're getting a couple questions on how much do, do these programs cost to run each year? I think there was a particular question for you, Devin, are you willing to share the annual operating budget of your compost sites? Maybe it's not just to you, Devin, but uh, let's just start. Um, any, anything you can offer on how much it cost. And Devin, I don't know if you said, I think Renee, I heard you say you have seven full-time employees. Devin, how many people are you employing? And can you share anything on your annual operating budget? Yeah, um, Debbie, do I have permission to talk about That's this? Fine. That's yeah, fine. Yeah, okay. Um, so we have nine full-time staff and uh, like two part-time staff and two per diem staff. Uh, the per diems just work a very large food scrap drop-offs uh, each weekend. Um, and then that's, you know, it's five full-time staff dedicated to servicing the 70, 75 food scrap drop-offs we have. Three staff to um, operate our two processing sites, myself, just, pushing people around and then uh, an outreach and education um, staff. So that collectively, like I said, I, I would, I don't know what it was this year exactly because it, it kind of shifted around a little bit, but I would say 85% of our budget would go to those personnel costs. And then the remaining is to support operations, you know, fuel, fuel maintenance, repairs, that sort of thing. And I think we're coming in around a million dollars for fiscal year uh, 22. Renee, is there anything you can share quickly just on your budget? Basically about the same. Um, I just pulled up our budget doc, but it includes like subcontract information. So it reflects other work yes, beside our own, but uh, yeah, that's right. That's good. It's yeah. sufficient to say, folks, that local government funding to keep these sites operating. We're only featuring two today um, of the community comp many compost sites in New York City, but you know, these this are substantial operations that the city is supporting with many many benefits. So we have two minutes left. I'm going to ask. We have a really good question on st other strategies to assist smaller communities, particularly with any cumbersome municipal contracting processes. I'll just read the question. Many of our small organizations have difficulty accessing resources because they do not have the capacity to jump through the hoops of our municipal contracting process. And let me just say, I think we're gonna be getting more into the contracts in the next two webinar series. So we won't have time to address that question today. And um, I just wanna do a quick round for each of you, if there's a, a, a key tip or lesson learned in really like 30 seconds each that you can um, share, that would be good. Debbie, I'm gonna, and this is for like other, Debbie, from your point of view, your tip could be um, to other local governments and Devin and Renee, 
you could do it from the viewpoint of other community composters. So Debbie, lightning round. <laughs> um, project for growth and uh, provide, you know, kind of in crafting contracts, provide room for flexibility. So, you know, you don't want to say only do this or only do that. It may be that like, you know, drop off and curbside have had a dance, you know, and community composting. So you want, you want the program to be flexible to kind of work collaboratively with other city programs going on at the time. Renee? Yeah, my tip is also related to contracts that if you're a small nonprofit to make sure you've got some like legal assistance or staff on this on team who can uh, dive into those nitty gritty contract details. Good. Devin? Uh, yeah, I would say lesson learned over the past couple of years is to develop and maintain uh, constant contact and uh, relationship with your local elected officials. Awesome. Thank you uh, to our panel for your um, participating today and all of you attendees to stay to the end. Um, one thing that will pop up now on your screens is a survey, and that's just from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance to help us improve our programming. We have a goal of reaching diverse audiences, so we have some questions about demographics um, and whatnot. All questions are optional. And again, we're not going to share the results, any personal identifying information at all, just for us to improve our programming. So we appreciate your participation in that. So we are going to end the webinar at this time, and we look forward to having you join uh, the next two. Happy International Compost Awareness Week, folks. Happy ICA. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.